Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture in the first module of Plant Biotechnology course. In this module, we are talking about the basics of uh, plant tissue culture, which would include a variety of topics like totipotency, differentiation, uh, somatic embryogenesis, organogenesis, micropropagation, meristema, shoot tip culture, and so on. My name is Manoj Sharma and I am working as an assistant professor of plant biology at Jawaharlal Nehru University where I teach plant biotechnology and genetic engineering at School of uh, Biotechnology. This lecture content has been reviewed by Dr. Kashmir Singh who is working as an associate professor of plant biology at Department of Biotechnology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. This project has been sponsored by DTH Swim Prabha MHRD New Valley. In the first lecture, we had discussed about the cellular totipotency and basics of organogenesis as well as somatic embryogenesis. In this lecture, I will first briefly discuss about the major landmark developments in the history of plant tissue culture and then I will discuss about the biological components or the parameters that influence the tissue culture responses. So plant tissue culture is a collective term that refers to various procedures that are used to grow and maintain plant cells or tissues or organs on an artificial media under aseptic conditions and controlled environment. So uh, basically, it's a tool to exploit the cellular totipotency. In last lecture, we learned about the totipotency, how each and every plant cell is totipotent, that is it's capable to regenerate into a whole plant body. So it's a tool to exploit the cellular totipotency of plant cells for several applications in plant biotechnology like micropropagation, that is the clonal uh, multiplication of the plants, production of uh, virus-free virus -free plants, crop improvement like production of uh, uh, haploids or uh, polyploids like uh, triploid bananas or triploid uh, uh, watermelon or grapes which are the seedless. So seed, uh, these are triploid plants are seedless and we like eating these are seedless fruits. Then uh, it's also uh, used, uh, frequently used to conserve the germplasm or important germplasm. Uh, somatic hybridization that uh, help us, helps us to bring the traits from two different species which are sexually incompatible uh, by the fusion of uh, the somatic cells. And then the genetic engineering based uh, plant improvement. So basically the the regeneration of uh, whole plants from few cells or tissues is, is kind of a basic requirement for the genetic engineering based intervention of the crop improvement. Now this whole process of tissue culture, it, uh, it includes several aspects or several steps like uh, how to grow experimental plants. Uh, how to select so how to select a uh, explant when we are talking about cells tissues or organs how to select which is the right tissue or which is the right organ or how to select what is the right size of this explant uh, to initiate the uh, cultures how to sterilize or how to clean these explants to initiate the uh, these these cultures or how to put this onto the onto the uh, onto the 
cultural media in, in a right orientation, choosing the right environmental variables like temperature, light, or various media components like the growth regulators or the nutrient, uh, uh, nutrient components. So it is very important to carefully select these, uh, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, steps or okay, make the careful selections for the successful cultures. Hence, certainly it requires an experienced and uh, vigilant eye. Overall, we can say that the success of a large number of, uh, uh, large number of uh, biotech-based applications in plant biology depends upon the successful establishment of the plant tissue culture for that particular species. Therefore, it's an exciting area actually in the plant biotechnology, in the establishing a plant tissue culture and with several applications in uh, basic as well as uh, applied sciences. Now, let's have a briefly uh, look at the landmark developments in the history of uh, plant tissue culture. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, we saw the development or uh, concept of the cell theory uh, which was given by Scleden and Squan independently in 1839, 38 or 39, where they worked independently, looked at to cell, uh, the microscopic structures, and uh, they postulated that uh, cell is a unit of uh, structure and function in an uh, organism. Several people started working after looking, uh, looking at uh, cells in the microscope, and uh, in the plants also people started working with the plant development, However, um, one major development uh, was, uh, uh, was reported in uh, 1878 by watching where he, he talked about the polar development in plants. Basically, he showed that the upper part of the stem segment always produce the buds or the shoots, whereas the lower part of the segment may produce uh, roots or a callus-like structure. It, and it is irrespective to the size of uh, the, uh, the size of the segment uh, the, uh, from the stem that were taken to the culture. It was an important development where cell determination was talked about that there is a uh, bipolar development. Uh, uh. Later, the theoretical basis of uh, the plant tissue culture were proposed by the Golive Hevelent in 1902 uh, for the first time uh, when he was addressing to the German Academy of Sciences. So in the last part of uh, 19th century, in 1890s, Golive uh, attempted to culture fully differentiated cells that were isolated from leaves, petioles, or any other fully differentiated tissues of uh, the plants but he was unsuccessful. He failed to actually culture them. However, based upon the experience to work on the topic for more than a decade, he learned several aspects of the plant tissue culture that were important for establishing successful cultures. So, he laid down several postulates uh, or the principles about the plant tissue culture when uh, he was talking uh, in 1902, and he published these uh, these uh, these principles. Now, later, several other uh, scientists examined his ideas about the plant tissue culture, about the about the postulates, what he was he had talked about, and confirmed them by experimentation. And later, he was uh, given the title of the father of uh, tissue culture. Uh, soon after, in the in, in, within a few years. Uh, Herrings and uh, uh, Brown, he actually successfully cultured the embryos of the crucifers on uh, the artificial media, that is the artificial, uh, artificial solutions of mineral salts and uh, sugar, and uh, actually successfully cultured them to, the, to maturity. I mean, full-fledged plants were, uh, were generated. And uh, this was also the confirmation of uh, what Golif has uh, said earlier in uh, 1902. So then there were a lot of developments uh, during this time. Several of several students uh, of the Golif Heverland uh, uh, 
did a lot of work uh, in establishing uh, uh, plant tissue culture. They, they were able to establish the uh, dividing root tip cells in the artificial cultures in 1920s uh, or early uh, late 19, uh, 1920s. Uh, however, one major development was in uh, 1929 when the Liebach, uh, he rescued the embryo from an interspecific hybrid. So, the hybrid, the interspecific hybrid was generated from two uh, plants or two species which were sexually incompatible. Uh, some embryos were formed and uh, these uh, scientists, they removed the embryo from uh, the plant and they, re they regenerated them on the artificial media and mature plants were produced. So if these wouldn't have been uh, rescued, these embryos would never have uh, uh, seen the maturity. Later in 1930s, Philip White he worked with the isolated root cultures and in 1934, White reported establishing continuously growing cultures of tomato root tips. They were maintained by uh, subculturing onto the fresh median for the longer period of time. Uh, in fact, in, he actually formulated the first synthetic media of uh, for the plant tissue culture, which was published in 1937 and was named as <coughs> White's Medium. It contained inorganic salts, sugars and vitamins. During next three decades, several exciting developments were seen, like use of the coconut water improved the callusing efficiency significantly or the callus culture for n number of species were uh, established even for the for the buddhist species or the herbaceous species which are actually recalcitrant or for which the callus uh, i mean uh, tissue culture establishing a tissue culture was a difficult job it was successfully achieved however in 1950s uh, the discovery of uh, kinetin or a, or a cytokinin uh, it was a great milestone uh, Soon after the discovery of kinetin or a, a, a cytokinin uh, hormone, the world had witnessed another landmark development in the field of plant tissue culture and it was the chemical control of the root and shoot differentiation. That is, uh, it was identified. That is, uh, exogenous supply of auxins and cytokinins uh, was able to greatly influenced the morphogenic fate of the callus cells it was uh, and specifically these studies were performed in tobacco so this was a huge development that uh, now uh, people knew that uh, uh, we can induce uh, induce the morphogenetic responses in the callus or we can induce the regeneration in the callus by by or by uh, kind of playing with the ratio of uh, or the balance of these uh, auxins and uh, cytokinins. Another major development was the formation of uh, somatic embryos from the carrot cells. It was also achieved by on the artificial media uh, during in late 1950s. So these were uh, this happened in 1950s, the late 50s. Now, by now it was well recognized that uh, the media salts and growth hormones greatly influence the tissue culture whether it is the callus initiation or uh, or uh, the morphogenesis induction or evoking the morphogenetic responses and uh, a lot of emphasis was put on to optimizing the media components like the media salts or uh, growth regulators uh, for culturing different kind of uh, salt combinations were tried different concentrations of these salts were uh, were tried or uh, uh, different combinations of uh, growth regulators or their concentrations were also optimized and uh, there was a lot of uh, stress was put or a lot of uh, 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 efforts were put towards optimizing this media and in 1962 uh, and in 1962 Murashi and Skook they, they published uh, another uh, another uh, media composition which is called as Murashi's or uh, Skook 
medium or it is also known as a MS basal medium. So basically they publish the recipe, it was the detailed composition uh, for all the media components of the salts that was uh, art that were required to artificially initiate the cultures from uh, or callus cultures from uh, the explants. So it's uh, called as the basal media and uh, even today uh, it is this basal media, MS basal media is uh, used as a starting point for initiating the plant tissue culture studies or optimizing the plant tissue culture protocols for the species where these protocols are not available. In 1964, there was a, another landmark development and uh, the contribution from the Indian scientific community. It was the successful establishment of uh, the anthraculture to produce the haploid plants. Uh, country, it was, uh, it was, uh, contribution was uh, made by uh, the scientists from uh, Delhi University, that is uh, Shipra Gua Mukherjee and uh, Professor S.C. Maheshwari, who could uh, establish the anthracultures cultures to develop the uh, haploid plants in the Thura. Uh, then in 1960s, uh, several development takes place and uh, people were you now able to uh, induced the morphogenetic responses and uh, regenerated the full uh, plants from the uh, in, in vitro starting from the explants and uh, then these protocols were replicated to several other species. Even in later part of 1960s there is a huge development of the protoplast culture, protoplast preparation and the protoplast uh, fusion. Uh, what we discuss in the somatic, um, uh, we will discuss later as uh, in the form of somatic hybridization. These developments were made in 19, uh, 1960s, uh, late 1960s. From 1917 onward, plant tissue culture evolved in the form of several different type of applications in almost every aspect of the plant biology research. Culturing of isolated cells helped to make uh, progress in studying plant, uh, uh, in studying cell behavior uh, like the cytological studies, nutrition, metabolic, cell metabolism or the changes which appear in the cells during the morphogenetic differentiation. Meristem culture were optimized which helped to develop the pathogen free plant and it proved to be a very useful for germplasm storage. Clonal propagation was established at the commercial scale and it is also one of the most widely used application even today. By mid 70s it was worked out that agrobacterium transform plants in order to cause the infection. That means that it transfer its uh, small segment of DNA. Uh, DNA into the plants and this fact uh, also kind of uh, developed a hypothesis that agrobacterium could be used to transfer the DNA of our own interest into the plant genome. It means that the foreign DNA could be delivered to the plant genome and in fact by early 1980s itself transgenic plants were, were developed. This technology developed or opened up a totally new era of plant tissue culture applications for crop improvement. Because for the genetic engineering studies, uh, for any genetic engineering based or plant transformation based crop improvement, the availability of regeneration protocol was kind of a prerequisite. In India, plant tissue culture was established in 1950s uh, at University of Delhi and soon after uh, several other centers uh, started working with the plant tissue cultures. These included Bose Institutes Kolkata, MS University Badodra, uh, National Botanical Research Institute Lucknow. Uh, but established. similarly several other universities later started working in this field and later in 1980s 
Department of Biotechnology was established that also has a, a one of the focus um, main focus re focused research on the plant tissue culture and its uh, applications in crop improvement or uh, agricultural biotechnology next is the various factors that are crucial for the plant tissue culture these factors are grouped in three broad categories uh, which are biological parameters chemical and physical parameters biological parameters are the ones which are associated with the biological material that we use to initiate the culture or another way we can say that they are associated with the explant then is the chemical factors like the media salts or the growth regulators and finally is the physical parameters that include light and temperature uh, etc in this lecture we will focus mainly on the biological parameters and uh, i will discuss the chemical and physical component in the next lecture so let's start with the biological factors first explant as we know is a segment of the plant which is separated from the parent plant and is used to initiate the in vitro culture in artificial conditions so the explant is the starting biological material and it can be any living part of the plant we can harvest any of the tissue it should be living that is the basic requirement however the physiological status of uh, these living tissues vary from one tissue to another tissue or the organ to organ on the same plant for better results it is very important to choose the right explant though every plant cell is a totipotent that is it has a capability to regenerate a complete plant however the ease of this process ease of initiating the in vitro culture from these explant may vary with the physiological status of uh, these explants and therefore these mitotically or metabolically active tissues uh, are the best for uh, best source for the uh, explant preparation the response is the in vitro culture responses from the metabolically or mitotically active tissues uh, would be the best from among all explants there are several different types of vegetative tissues that can uh, that are in the different stage of uh, metabolic uh, activity and uh, can be used uh, to initiate the in vitro cultures like meristems apical meristem it may be the root apical meristem or shoot apical meristem axillary buds cotyledons the first embryonic leaves actual leaves roots or the root apical meristems hypocotyls inflorescence buds anther immature embryo so all these tissues uh, can be used as they are actively growing however the potentiality of these tissue would depend upon that particular particular species so basic requirement uh, is that uh, one thing basic uh, uh, fundamental thing that we need to keep in mind that uh, we need to harvest the explants from actively dividing tissues which are and it will be most responsive and best results will be produced now potentiality of the same organ to use as explant also varies with the species it does not mean that if the one explant like the apical meristem or the cotyledon if it is uh, we are getting very good results in species a then certainly it would produce good results in species b also the physiological status of the same organ or the same tissue may be very different between the two species Uh, so like for example if we take the leaf tissue or the cotyledon tissue then we compare the monocot versus dicot now in tobacco or tomato we can use the leaf segments to initiate the culture uh, and uh, they it's just very successful we use it and uh, uh, they are frequently actually used uh, in uh, in the tissue culture protocols however if we talk about the monocot like the rice or the sorghum uh, leaf segments do not uh, respond at all 
it is it is almost uh, it is very difficult to uh, initiate or induce the callosing response from the leaf tissues of uh, the, these plants so the the conclusion is that uh, we should harvest the the x plant from uh, uh, actively dividing and metabolically active tissues next is the the health of the donor plant the health of the plant itself from where we are harvesting the x plant so the physiological physiological health of the donor plant has a huge impact on the regeneration potential of the explants now what happens in the the physiology of the plant development it changes with the seasons that is the environmental conditions around like for example if there is a flowering plant now spring it it flowers in the spring season so this season would be best for its growth and it will be metabolically very active uh, during this time however the same plant uh, in the winter season may be may not be metabolically active or may be metabolically dormant and even if it is active it will be growing at a very slow pace during these extreme cold conditions we call these uh, these conditions as a physiological dormancy so uh, x plant harvested during the physiological dormancy would have low regeneration potential so during the favorable growth parameters plant grow actively and explants uh, from these mitotic tissues would perform much better however during the unfavorable conditions when the plant tissues are almost dormant very little metabolic activity is there same explant uh, would not uh, produce the same result as uh, it produced when it was harvested from the metabolically active state so the physiological state of the same organ also varies with uh, uh, with the with the season so it is very important to look for the right uh, season in right environmental condition for harvesting the uh, harvesting the ex plants now stress on the plants also compromises the regeneration potential yes that's fine we are talking about that we should Uh, look for the right season like the spring season is best for this flowering plant that we were talking about in the last example however during the spring season also there may be some other stress factor which is limiting its, its growth like maybe there is not enough water for this plant uh, and there is a drought like condition so now these condition these stress conditions compromise the metabolic activity of or the growth and development of this plant and this plant is stressed and uh, so these stress plants also the they, they, the the explant harvested from these stress plants even during the season when these plants grow best may not produce the good results because of the compromised status of uh, the physiological activity of uh, these plants and so uh, we we need to make sure that uh, plants are actively growing they are healthy and uh, they are not stressed so the ex uh, in this way if we talk about the green house grown plants or the uh, or the plants grown in the culture room where conditions are or external conditions are controlled they 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 perform better so the ex plant harvested from the green house uh, green house grown plants they perform much better as compared to the field grown plants and even like aseptically uh, grown seedlings ex plant will perform even better than the greenhouse grown plants so aseptically uh, in vitro seedlings uh, they produce the best results now the genotype of uh, the of the of the plant now it's also well known fact now that uh, the regeneration or the somatic embryogenesis or the organogenesis uh, in is, is an uh, genetically controlled trait it is genetically regulated striking differences in the regeneration potential among the various uh, varietal lines or the intra varietal lines or the inter varietal lines have been uh, reported in the past so the different cultivars of the same species may respond differently and certainly different species may respond very differently though they belong to the same genus 
now the differences these differences may be because of the differences in the endogenous levels of uh, these growth regulators now growth regulators they are the integral part of the plant development or morphogenetic responses they are naturally produced in the plants which result in the natural differentiation that is a uh, root and shoot differentiation and a differentiation of uh, all other tissues and so these hormones they are there they are produced their concentration may vary from one tissue to another tissue and uh, hence the the in the endogenous level or endogenous concentrations of uh, these hormones or the growth regulators it can also impact the 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 response of these explant to the tissue culture it has been found that the cultivars or the varieties that usually have higher embryogenic potential higher somatic embryogenic potential they usually have lower level of uh, phytohormones in their ovules so basically endogenous level of uh, the phytohormones in the explant uh, would also impact the uh, response of these explants to the in vitro conditions now this brassica is a very good example to describe the genetic control of uh, the regeneration process so brassica oleracea is a uh, that is uh, we we know it as a cabbage or a cauliflower it has a very good regeneration potential it means that the regeneration protocols are easily available and uh, it is comparatively easier to establish the cultures or in vitro cultures from the explant harvested uh, from brassica oleracea however brassica campestris we know it as a chinese cabbage or turnip is least regenerative in, in among the brassica uh, species so what does that mean that means that if we uh, it is difficult uh, to initiate the in vitro cultures from the uh, explant that were harvested from brassica campestris now there is another brassica species brassica nepus which was uh, which is a allo uh, ploid uh, generated from uh, these uh, two cultivars uh, two species brassica oleracea and uh, brassica campestris and uh, if we see the regeneration potential of this brassica nephus is intermediate between the regeneration potential from brassica oleracea and brassica campestris so this perform better uh, in the in vitro cultures as compared to the brassica campestris however brassica oleracea perform better than this one so this clearly describe or explain the genetic regulation of uh, the regeneration so the genotype itself uh, can influence the influence the the genetic uh, or uh, uh, or the response of the explants towards the in vitro cultures so therefore many times when we when we are establishing the cultures uh, for the first time for any one particular species and uh, we start we should start with the multiple cultivars it it's many times it's, uh, it's it's possible that uh, we pick a cultivar that is very recalcitrant to the regeneration response and hence uh, it will it will uh, it it may not respond or it will take longer time to establish uh, to identify or to optimize the cultural conditions for these ones rather than if we find a cultivar which is a responsive or a better which produce the better results so so the genotype do have a very or very important or significant impact on the regeneration potential of uh, the the plants then is the size of explants so generally the explants which are very small they are harder to culture like if you want to establish the culture from a single cell or the protoplast it they they are more difficult to establish as compared to when larger segment of the plants are used like if we are using the leaf segment or cotyledons as the explants so initiating the callus will be much easier as compared to when we are using the single cells or the protoplast and it is probably because uh, the larger plants may have the larger nutrient resources or the hormonal reserves hence they perform better in response to the to to the in vitro cultures another important component is the contamination that is the source plant from where we are harvesting the explants 
excising the explant, they should not be contaminated with the pathogen. Now, infection is actually a stress on the plant. It compromises the, the physiological status of the explant. It compromises the metabolic activity, growth and development. And in addition, if your explants are contaminated, they were difficult to clean and uh, they may contaminate your uh, cultures, cultures also. So, it is very important that uh, our, uh, our plants from where we are harvesting the explant, they should not be contaminated from the pathogens. In addition, the location of the explant on the source plant also matters, specifically if they are field grown plants or if they are, uh, I mean, they, they are field, field grown plants. Like if the explant are harvested uh, from the locations closer to the soil, they are harder to clean. They are, they, they may be more infections uh, on these uh, tissues which are closer to the soil as compared to the tissues which are away from the soil on the, uh, towards the uh, tip of the plant. So, it is always good idea to harvest the explants which are uh, from the tissues which are located at the uh, uh, position away from the soil. Uh, in the in the plant. So, typically aseptically grown seedling would be the best source and uh, this location would not impact uh, in, in, the, in, that, uh, in that condition. Next is the orientation on the media. Now, orientation of the explant also can also influence the tissue culture. The orientation means how we are placing the explant on the media. Now, this is a tomato seedling or tomato uh, plantlet. Here we see the abaxial surface that is uh, the lower surface of the plant is the abaxial surface and the upper surface of the plant is adaxial surface. So, if we are using the explant segments from the leaf tissue, we can either place the avax, uh, avaxial surface touching the media that is the low surface touching the media or we can place the, these leaf segments upside down that is the adaxial surface touching the media. However, it has been found that uh, response of these explants are much better when they were uh, placed uh, with avaxial site touching in contact with the media that is the lower surface of the leaf touching the media they perform better. Even like a, a two fold uh, differences or a two fold uh, uh, callousing responses has been reported just because of the orientation of uh, these explant in, in, in some species. So, today in this lecture we learned about the landmark developments of uh, plant tissue culture and various biological parameters of uh, biological material that greatly influence the tissue culture process. The parameters that uh, uh, I discussed today were explant health, health of the donor plants, genotype of the source uh, uh, species, explant size, contamination or the orientation of the explants on the media. And in the next session, I will discuss about the chemical and physical parameters influencing plant tissue cultures. Thank you.